They didn't warn me it was going to be bright, so. Um, we still got people coming in, but um, so this is going to start doing uh, a little bit of the intro we're talking about. So while everybody comes in, we'll, we'll get to the meat of it. So uh, welcome. Hope everybody's having a great, great convention. Thanks for showing up. Uh, this is fantastic. We're really excited to talk about um, some of this stuff because it's fresh off the presses. So uh, we're going to be talking about um, um, photovoltaics uh and uh some of the findings that are um recent for us so i have um here with me um alexander lazar as one of a um senior security researchers uh we both work for a company called bit defender uh you may have heard of um i added a link here to uh our work so you can re uh, refer to it later uh some of the um vulnerability research that we do so um we've been doing um among other things, we've been doing um, IoT vulnerability research for the last 10 plus years um, on normally and typically consumer grade devices that are popular or interesting or something that we find um, just yeah interesting to look at. So um, during this time, we've um, published over 25 high profile cases uh, and findings, and uh, we have dozens of white papers that came out of that research. Um, this is a pretty small team, but um, it's been it's been really lucrative and and exciting on our academic and uh, educational side. So I want to quote a couple of um, a couple of um, high profile cases that we we covered uh, findings that we had. So I'll say ring doorbell for example, LG, LG TVs. This is something that's as fresh as a month old. Maybe you know the Fire Stick from Amazon. Maybe the August August Lock ring a bell. Um, Wise, um, Outlet, UFI, EasyViz cameras and more. Um, What's interesting that through our research and what we found, obviously beside vulnerabilities, um, is that more than 30% of the vendors never reply or they don't reply timely. Um, and um, to our contact, then we try to reach out to them. And it takes, uh, often it takes them more than uh, 180 days to do so. And what's even more concerning is that uh, 20% of these people take uh, more than a year to fix the vulnerabilities that we are trying to communicate to them or never actually patch these sometimes or most of the times exceeding the uh, end of life cycle of that product. So uh, here's a PSA to uh, all the vendors. If you could pass on the word, uh, appoint a permanent contact, set up a vulnerability disclosure program, and you're all for it. Uh, put a, PG key, a PGP key on it and monitor that inbox. I uh, can't stress that enough. So. Um, this is the um, has been for the last decade and a half or more the most wanted terrorist in the United States and abroad when it comes to um, the power grid, uh, the squirrel, um, and it's called squirrel terrorism. There is a squirrel index uh, on Wikipedia, and we have a couple of quotes here. For example, we have um, a former uh, Dep deputy director of the NSA that said, "Frankly, the number one." Uh, threat uh, today to the grid is squirrels. And then um, the threat to the internet infrastructure services uh, posed by squirrels makes seed the one um, posed by cyber attacks and so on, so on. So basically the, the narrative here is in general um, that cybersecurity is not really potential straight up concern when it comes to the power grid because most of the actual um, um, attacks were of natural causes uh, squirrels, fires, whatever have you. In general, the grid is really highly regulated and protected and secured. So a lot of the cyber attack woes don't really apply, even though we have, you know, warnings from CIA with examples and NSA and all this stuff. So um, to that, enter solar. Um, and this is what we're going to talk quickly about today. So obviously, green energy is the forefront of everything that we do. So as it's transforming the global landscape, we're seeing uh, just you know, last year, um, over 500 gigawatts of um, of capacity added by solar um, just last year, which is three quarters. Um, it, it's a it's an explosive growth, which obviously is fantastic for us. But at the same but at the same time brings, um, you know, um, they you know the growing number of systems obviously brings more interest and more uh, focus to the uh, to them uh, to potential attackers. So as the capacity increases. The question is, you know, is security keeping up um, as both businesses and consumers are starting to add um, solar panels to their uh, to their portfolios? Now, 
um, again, this space, solar is less hard, hardened and regulated by um, as legacy uh, power generation. So to that point, we investigated a manufacturer called Day and a management platform called Solarman to find out. Why? Um, it's because these are smart systems and they can be obviously controlled remotely. Uh, someone in our office noted something that was interesting after installation, so we decided to keep digging. Um, an inverter, um, and I'll show you, I'll show you a, um, a, a sketch just to see how the how the stuff works out, uh, could be added on both these platforms um, using their apps. Uh, you just needed the serial number. So it was interesting enough. So here's a diagram of a system and trying to understand how it works. This applies for both um, residential customers, but also uh, larger platforms as well. So you have um, you have the solar panels. Let's say you have solar panels on the top, you know, on your home. These connect to an inverter that feeds the grid. The grid is connected to uh, the inverter is connected to a data logger. That's a bridge between uh, all these systems. Um, and the data logger sends information to a, a, a cloud platform that feeds into various application and management systems as well. So again, the logger the, um, uh, is, is the uh, conduit that connects everything to the internet and isn't you know, responsible for the settings and the data collection and updates of the whole system. Um, in general, it's, these will be connected and they won't be um, because they won't work otherwise with a, gra uh, with a grid. So obviously, uh, end users can control the system from the internet, from their phones, or just another platform, and they can talk directly to the platform. And I'm going to invite Alex to um, discuss and walk us through how we investigated the platform. OK. So we started with a man-in-the-middle attack on the day cloud app. We only use the user certificate, no need to patch the application. Among the traffic, we found a suspicion login request using hard-coded credentials. I don't know if you can see them, but it is smartconfigurator at solarmantv.com and the password 123456, first place on the Rocky list. Okay, what is the account used for? It gets information about a user's device. For example, the model, the version, and a password. This account is not linked to any user account, so it works for any device, no matter who owns them. Now, I mentioned the password. A logger, while it is running, has an access point active. The SSID of the access point has a convenient naming scheme. It starts with AP underscore serial number. So, if you have the serial number of the logger, we can get into the access point. Let's see how an attack would look. First, we find an access point that corresponds to the naming scheme. Then we get the serial number. We use the hard-coded account uh, to make the request and get the password. Connect to the access point and just profit. OK, those question marks do some heavy lifting, but it basically boils down to sending 80 commands to the logger to get access to the user interface, to get access to the user's Wi-Fi network, and just send commands to the logger. Now, there are some downsides to this attack. First of all, you need physical proximity. Then you need to maintain said physical proximity. You also only get one device at a time. And as much fun as war driving is, it's not very efficient. I think we can do better. Now, we looked at other platform features. And uh, we saw that users can only view statistics and information about their system. To make changes, they require to add a business account as a guest. How is this done? Well, there is a search API that returns data about all users and organizations. In the front end, we only see the name of the business when, it's a, when we search for them. But in the back end, we have emails, phone numbers, addresses, user IDs, for example, we have a vote, an endpoint for a business. We have the administration name, the admin, admin's phone number. And for the users, we get the last login IP. We get the, their address if they put it there. By itself, it's not really exploitable, at most being a privacy issue. But it gives us a ballpark for the total number of users, about three and a half millions, and the total number of businesses, uh, over 300,000. 
we'll keep this in mind, as it might be useful later. Now, I talked about Solarman and Day, then that's because until recently, Day was using the Solarman infrastructure to run its code. But recently, they built its own data center and migrated its user to a new database. The code also runs on their new data center. But we wondered, maybe the code is still pretty similar. And it turns out it's very similar. A token from Day will work on Solarman. It gives access to an account that has the same user ID. But the users were migrated, so now a user from Day has a different user ID from the one on Solarman. So the user IDs are also incremental. A new account gets an ID of about 14 million on Solarman and at about 13 million on Day. This means that by creating new accounts on Day, you could take over over 1 million accounts. That's good, but I think we can do even better. Now, I keep talking about JVT tokens, and let's see how they are obtained. For a normal user, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you send the email address, the password, the hash password, and you get back a JVT token containing your email and your user ID. A business account is a bit different. One account can manage multiple organizations, and when logging in, an admin will choose which business to manage. The server creates a token that specifies the organization's ID. Let's see the steps. The first step is basically identical to a normal user, and I highlighted in the decoded token the fields that pertain to the organization, the organization ID and the group ID. At the second step, using the token from the first one, we get a list of organizations that, a business, uh, that an admin can manage. And in the third step, we have another login request to the same endpoint, but this time it's, it uses an authorization header with the bearer token we got from the first step. And uh, in the post body, we also have the same token together with the organization ID. The server responds and completes the fields that I highlighted earlier and pertain to the user organization. Now, what is the issue? In the third step, the endpoint uses data from the token we sent in the post body and creates the, to the new token that has access to the organization. So we thought, let's just change the user ID and email and the token we sent. And it just worked. No signature checks, no errors, didn't even need alg none. The endpoint didn't even need the authorization header. We could use it just like that. This is a request with a manufactured token that we sent and the one we received. Uh, the tokens here look pretty similar. The one on the left is the one we manufactured. And the difference between them is that the one on the left has a bad signature because obviously we don't know the key to sign the um, token. But the one on the right is signed by the server and it gives us access to any account we want. I mentioned that we need the ID and email to create this token, but if you remember earlier, we have some endpoint which gives us this information for all accounts. So this time, all three and a half million accounts were risking takeover. Kudos to them, they fixed this in 24 hours since we contacted them. Now I'll let Dan talk about the impact. Thanks, Alex. So um, this context, um, I'll show this more in the uh, timeline. So this is very fresh. We published the findings uh, just a couple of days ago. So um, take this um, list of uh, vendors with a little bit of a grain of salt. It's um, mostly inferred, but it's a highly, let's just say highly informed uh, chance that these vendors were also impacted because they do share the Solomon uh, platform and potentially use the same database. Um, and we can additionally infer um, their potential impact by the fact that we were seeing um, stuff like this popping up around the same time um, we informed um, the vendors of the findings. So um, 
some of these vendors also patched right away and informed the users about the existing patches. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about um, the actual impact in terms of um, you know users. So we, we're seeing, um, you were estimated about three and a half million users could have been impacted by the vulnerabilities uh, uh, exemplified here and uh, more than 330,000 businesses. Um, all these control multiple systems. Um, of course, there's a PII component, so having access to the platform could enable um, a malicious actor to um, obtain information um, uh, about the users and location and so on and so forth. Um, so that's bad in itself, bad enough in itself, but, um, but at the same time, having access and controlling, being able to control uh, the inverters um, through the management platform could also um, either overload or underload the grid. So basically use your imagination um, of what could have been done here. Also, it's worth mentioning that the platform uh, serves about a fifth of uh, world's total solar generation capacity. So it's quite a quite an impressive number. Um, kind of put that into perspective, it's larger than what the uh, US uh, generates through uh, photovoltaics alone. So um, the question is, uh, does this finally beat the squirrels now? Uh, because, um, and of course, uh, the echoes of national security um, uh, follow. The idea here being that um, the conversation generally around the grid is that, well, as I said earlier, it's either the squirrels or, natu uh, or natural causes. We're not here to place FUD around um, uh, about um, solar, but kind of trying to shine a light that the situation might be changing for the future. And I think it, it warrants a little more attention. Um, I have the timeline here. Um, we contacted the companies um, sometime in mid-May. Uh, they've been fairly responsive uh, at both acknowledging and um, fixing the vulnerabilities. Um, and we actually closed disclosure to, the, to these findings um, just a few days ago. With that said, um, I'm inviting you to ask whatever questions there might be. Um, you can also find us at the um, IT Village. We have a we have a little table there, and we have a challenge um, to hack a TV. Um, and please do not forget, if you know a vendor, uh, remind them to appoint a permanent contact a contact for vulnerability um, uh, findings to set up a program for vulnerabilities, a URL for it, put a PGP key on it and monitor that inbox, please. So with that said, thank you for coming. Um, we're open for questions. And if there's no questions, just come by, um, come by the village and we can talk more. So thanks so much for your time. I'll see you guys there. Thank you.